Hello and welcome back to Bossing English with Mr. F. Today, five-ish minutes, five-ish features on an extract from The Prelude by William Wordsworth from the AQA Power and Conflict Poetry Anthology. We're going to start by looking at context, something that should be integrated into your answer, not just kind of tagged on at the end of a paragraph. As you can see, whenever I'm analysing language, structure, form or context, or even contrasting it with another poem, as I have to do in this question, I'm always linking that back to meaning. And the meaning will change depending on the question, because obviously they'll be asking you to spoke, uh, focus on a specific interpretation of the poem from the angle of maybe fear or abuse of power or um, conflict, um, you know, the effects of war, something like that. Romanticism and the sublime. Like other romantic poets, such as Shelley and Blake, Wordsworth saw the sublime in monumentally grand landscapes which induce awe and terror in humans. In my description, I will link to a lovely British Library article on romantics. I encourage you to read that and make notes. And I'll also link to another YouTube video which looks at Edmund Burke's analysis of the sublime around the same time that Wordsworth was writing, showing how... Um, that feeling of the sublime, that awe and terror, and why uh, people are drawn to it. The prelude subtitle, the work's subtitle is Growth of a Poet's Mind, which I think is very significant. The poem was written on and off from 1798 to 1839, uh, and it contains autobiographical reflections of his own development as a poet. This makes this childhood experience that we get in this extract seem even more important as a life-changing event, the fact that he kept returning to it as an adult. He describes his youth as, quote, the seed time of his soul. So I think there's some lovely context you could use there to talk about this traumatic experience. It was also written in response to other poets. The poem can be seen as a response to John Milton's attempt to justify the ways of God to man in his great epic poem, Paradise Lost. I think that's from the 1700s. Sorry, the 1600s, the 17th century. Wordsworth's justification of his poetic vocation was an audacious attempt to make the epic personal, giving the genre a new psychological focus. That comes from the British Library website, and I expect the same article that I'm going to link to in the description. There are different versions. The 1799 version is different from the 1850 posthumous, published after his death version. The prelude was the product of a lifetime. For the last part of his life, Wordsworth had been, quote, polishing the style and qualifying some of its most sorry, some of its radical statements about the divine sufficiency of the human mind in its communion with nature. Interesting word there, radical, uh, because we use that maybe when thinking about Blake's attitude to London and politics of the time, and maybe even uh, Shelley, if we view Ozymandias uh, as a radical uh, political statement, uh, talking about his present moment, but setting it in the past as a distancing device. Okay, structurally, it's very interesting. There are three sections, and you'll probably be familiar with this. The first section in light pink uh, is really one of uh, tranquility. Um, and then the next section, which is introduced by the linker, contrast linker, but introduces the action and event of rowing and having the mountain loom up and terrify the child. And finally, introduced again by another but, we get the traumatic episode after the event uh, of being haunted by this experience. The child's point of view is used, even though it's written as an adult, so he's revisiting this trauma. Use of vague language, the inability to verbalize experience, because seen via a child's perspective, but recollected and recreated as an adult poet. Use of personification adds to this childlike awe, wonder, fear. So it's a trauma relived. So we're thinking about things like as if with voluntary power, instinct upreared its head with purpose of its own and measured motion strode after me. That's the personification. And the vague language would be things like the grim shape, like a living thing. So shape and thing are quite indeterminate. And even the repetition may be a huge peak, black and huge shows a child's limited vocabulary. You could use that as well. Moving on to language, well, interestingly, uh, again, I was thinking of uh, Ozymandias as a p possible comparison poem. There are limited horizons in this, which links to a child's view of the world. The child's life is circumscribed and has boundaries. 
we see the horizon's utmost boundary and the horizon's bound. So his world is kind of walled in by mountains when he's uh, staying in the Lake District here. This is the opposite of the end of Ozymandias, which is, quote, boundless and bare. So the child's horizons are traumatically expanded by this experience. It's a moment of epiphany, of awakening. Furthermore, there's a semantic field of the sublime. That's that feeling of awe and terror in, in the landscape, uh, which make, makes me think of maybe the paintings of Caspar David Friedrich. You might know the wanderer above a sea of fog. Uh, so the summit of a craggy ridge, the craggy steep, huge peak, black and huge, the idea of power, the grim shape, shape towering up, etc. And finally, when we're in that traumatic episode at the end, we get this indeterminate and obscure language and inability of the child to articulate this traumatic experience. Uh, there's an awareness of the scale of the natural world, the universe and his insignificance. So my dim brain worked with a dim and undetermined sense of unknown modes of being. It's all very vague and wishy-washy, isn't it? But there's something traumatic that he's unable to articulate, hung at a darkness, call it solitude or blank desertion. He doesn't know what to call it. He ho hovers between these two possibilities, huge and mighty forms. Well, what forms are they? We don't know. Um, and we, what we see is that things that were familiar have been left behind, abandoned now. He's not able to find comfort or solace in those. No familiar shapes, no pleasant images, no colors. So a rule of three there of negation of all the things that he can't access anymore that were once familiar, comforting, pleasant, and friendly to him have been replaced by huge and mighty forms, unknown modes of being, dark things. So we might compare this experience with a capital E to Blake's Song of Experience uh, in, in London. Finally, the poem is written in blank verse epic. Uh, so that's the, sorry, the form of the poem is blank verse epic. There's no stanzas, it's one continuous flow, but it is written in iambic pentameter. So that's da 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 da. Unstressed, stressed syllables. One summer evening led by her, I found a little boat tied to a willow tree. And that's mostly stuck to, uh, to give a kind of rhythm uh, a unifying rhythm uh, and to tie into kind of epic blank verse, uh, the historical lineage there that he's calling upon, even though he's reinventing it with this more psychological, autobiographical uh, slant. Right, hopefully that has been useful to you. Likey like, subby sub, and I will be back more. Um, I will be back with more Felicity Anon. Bye for now.